live. Um, cool. He'll be here in just a second. Tom, we got a riff for a bit as uh, things are as things are calming down. So we had a That's bit good. of a challenge today. Uh, oh wait, we need to go in like that. Sorry, I want a bit of a technical challenge. I apologize for being late. Uh, a lot of like weird Zoom updates and Windows and all sorts of weird technology challenges. Tom, can you introduce yourself? Uh, sure. I get Hugo up and up and going. Yeah, so my name is Tom Augsburger. Um, I work at Anaconda on uh, open source libraries like Dask and Pandas um, are the big ones. Uh, and for today, the important bit is probably that I'm the uh, maintainer of Dask ML, which is a library that aims to do parallel scalable machine learning in Python. Um, so it's a fun, very fortunate position I'm in to be able to work on these libraries. You're like the most glorified janitor in the world, I think, Tom. Um, them, yeah. Yeah. So you're not so right. So you maintain pandas. Uh, you maintain Dask. You maintain the connection to pandas and Dask, which is not a trivial process. Uh, you also help build things like Dask ML, which is like not just one project. It's like five or six different projects. Can you talk a little bit about maybe the history of Dask ML, like how it sort of came together? Yeah. Um, so. I think in its very earliest iteration, uh, it was actually just um, some documentation on how to use Dask and libraries like uh, Scikit-Learn together. Um, and we had the, these kind of um, uh, you know parallel efforts at you know machine learning, scalable machine learning. We had think libraries like Dask GLM, which implements some linear models um, to work on top of Dask arrays. Uh, we had things like Dask XGBoost, Dask, Dask TensorFlow, all these different things um, that didn't have like a central home um, for documentation for like, you know, how do you use these things? What are some examples of using these things together? Um, and then there are also some like utility things like there wasn't like a home for train test split that might have actually lived in uh, Dask array um, for a while. Um, like years ago. Um, so anyway, uh, a couple years ago, two probably, maybe three years ago, um, we started on the Dask ML library itself. Um, and so it collected some of these various pieces and then also provided a new home to implement things like, um, you know, custom estimators, uh, lots of different things. Um, and that, that story actually leaves out one, um, probably like the simplest and most important um, piece, which is the Dask ML or Dask uh, Joblib backend, which we'll talk about uh, once we get to the demo, but that lives in Joblib itself. Yeah. I think what I remember going through with Dask ML, uh, uh, sorry, one sec. So you know, we've had some technical difficulties, uh, like Hugo is in the background, like scrambling to get all the other people who are subscribed to this. Uh, over over here. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, whenever, whenever being odd about Dask ML, interesting about Dask ML, so we made Dask Array first, we made Dask Array after that, and both of those had very sort of clear abstractions. Um, and Dask ML had like 50 different things going on, or maybe like 10 different things going on, very different kinds of algorithms. Um, mm -hmm. It was, as you said, there's like, there's, we hacked into Joblib. We like to play around with actually boost. We played around with GLMs. There wasn't a like one clear way to do machine learning. And actually maybe it's like a uh, representative of machine learning more broadly. There isn't one clear way to do machine learning. It's a bunch of different kinds of algorithms that are all under the same umbrella, mm -hmm. uh, which is super fun, but also mm -hmm. uh, a bit of a challenge sometimes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And like, we'll, we'll see a bit of that today as we go through the examples, like, there's just like so much uh, that could be done. And especially when you go to like the parallel distributed side of things, it gets really challenging um, to implement and maintain. And yeah, it's just like, there's a lot that could be done. And DaskML has definitely picked some of the low hanging fruit, I would say. A um, lot more to be done though, if people are interested. Yeah, so what I would love to hear about a little bit is an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. Maybe in the meantime, people who are just coming on, if you can maybe just you know, give a quick shout out in the chat of you know who you are, where you're from, where you're excited about seeing, uh, and we can get some questions from the audience uh, during during the general conversation. But can you, uh, Tom, just give us a little bit of a little bit of an overview of what we're talking about today? Yeah. Uh, so today 
focuses on uh, scalable machine learning. Um, we'll see a bit about um, how I like to think about that at a high level. Um, the types of, you know, you have some workflow that's probably based around NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, or XGBoost that works well for um, small problems. And then there's different types of scaling challenges that you can run into. Um, I like to think about it scaling the size of the data versus scaling the size of the model, and then some strategies for dealing with each of those challenges. So we'll see things like big grid searches. We'll see things like uh, doing different types of uh, estimators on, on uh, larger than memory data sets, um, and then kind of tie it to all together at the end, hopefully. Okay, great. Do you want to jump in? Uh, sure. I'm uh, waiting for a cluster to come up now. So <laughs> I, I might ping you for that um, based on a recent change. That's just Let's fine. See. We'll see if the workers come in. If not, I'll, uh, I'll holler. Um, let me share my screen, though. All right, and uh, yeah, so all this notebook is on my GitHub. I'll clean a few things up um, and then um, post it there, but um, I'll put the URL somewhere. Okay, and now we have some, at least one worker coming in, so I think we're good to go. Um, okay, cool, so yeah, so starting us off, like, like I mentioned, um, well, so from both, both like, I was talking earlier about it, the maintainer point of view, like, Scalable distributed machine learning is can be difficult, um, but it's also it can be difficult from the user's side of things. Like it's, you know, distributed computing is fundamentally more complicated than single machine. I think so. Um, it's worth act asking yourself, like, do you actually need uh, distributed machine learning before you you know, go and, and jump into it? So um, anyway, assuming that you actually do need distributed machine learning, uh, what 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 types of uh, reasons you know might might push you there? And so I was saying earlier, we kind of these two scaling challenges that we might run into. So the typical you know from the maintainer side point of view is like who might Dask ML be appropriate for? Um, you know people here in this box where their data sets uh, their data sets aren't too large. Okay, so they fit comfortably in RAM. Um, and their problems aren't too big. Uh, we'll talk exactly about what this is in a bit, but if you're here in this box, then DaskML is definitely not appropriate for you. Like you don't need it. So you'd be much better off using scikit-learn or XGBoost or like GBM. Like those are much better tested. They battle tested tons and tons of users and they work, you know, they're designed for this kind of problem for problems where the data set fits in memory and the, the model isn't too large. So um, DaskML might be for people who are running into some scaling challenges with one of those libraries. Um, along the horizontal axis here, um, I have the size of the data set. And so, you know, there's some, you know, depending on how large of a machine you have access to, you know, there's some limit, uh, you know, the number of uh, rows of your data set that can fit in memory. Um, and past that, you know, you're 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 having to change something, whether that's your data structure or whether that's like your algorithm, how you read it in. You're gonna have to change something once you get past the uh, RAM limits. Um, so we'll see an example of dealing with that. Um, and then along the vertical axis here, at the size of the model or the complexity of the model, or like you know how long your model takes to train. Um, and you know, past this is a very fuzzy line. You know, there's not like a an equivalent to RAM bound. You know, you can fit any model given infinite time, but you know, at some point, you know, it, it interrupts your workflow where you become you know CPU bound, and it's just the cycle of developing a model. You know, iterating on it is is just too slow, and so you want to speed that up with a cluster, perhaps. So, those are the two cases we're going to be looking into here. Um, starting off with the first one, so this one's probably a bit simpler to think about. Um, you have CPU or you know compute bound more generally. So if you're using a GPU, um, even they can become uh, compute bound. So you know maybe you need a cluster of GPUs or something. Um, okay, so in this case, we're gonna take a very um, simple little example from Scikit-Learn. We have um, a data set that we're generating here. So just five thousand uh, samples. A uh, small data set and then a little grid search here. 
um, with some number of parameters. I don't, I don't know exactly. And we're going to fit a grid search over this support vector classifier. Um, on my laptop, this takes, so I'm just doing a grid search dot estimator dot fit. I'll make this a bit bigger. Um, so this is just spitting one of the estimators on this small data set. And it took about a second and a half. Um, and now you can you know, extrapolate that out. You have some like five CV splits. You have some number of uh, combinations here. Uh, it would take you know, some linear scaling there of that second and a half. Um, maybe that's too slow for me. I want to do it on a cluster. Uh, that's like you know, pretty easy to do uh, from the user side of things. You know, you're going to say with joblib.parallel backend, uh, grid search.fit. And then you know, stuff happens here on the cluster. Um, so again, if you haven't seen the DAS dashboard, each one of these is a task. And vertically here, we have the cores on our cluster. I think I have like uh, 40 cores, 20 cores. I'm not actually sure. Um, so each one of these is like a uh, fitting one of those SBC uh, hyperparameter combinations on some CV split of the data set. And you know, that finished in 20 some seconds. And so like I was saying, you know, this is probably like the simplest uh, part of scalable distributed machine learning, but it's also one of the most uh, impactful, I would say. Um, yeah, so I don't know if there are any questions here. I, I don't have the chat open, so Matt, just like interrupt me if you see anything come through. Yeah, you know, I'll, um, I'll, I'll monitor the chat and send things to you. So I mean, just, I'm actually just trying to do some back envelope math. So it looks like it took 20 seconds to run. Uh, and now you've got, uh, Ray asks, what's the size of your cluster? I think you said it's like 40 cores, is that right? Uh, client. Uh, let me go up here. Uh, that one's not a widget. So yeah, 40 cores. Right. So 40 cores, 20 seconds. That's you know something like 10, 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like it's it's a nice difference between 20 seconds and 12 minutes. Like we we would yeah. not be able to run this experiment in a webinar setting, for example. Right. Or just yep. go on through a notebook. We would have gone and gone for a coffee and maybe lunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's like a nice, uh, you know, in terms of lines of code changed, uh, very little. Uh, in terms of like infrastructure, you know, uh, well, yeah, sign up for Coiled or whatever. Uh, it was fairly easy for me to uh, get going um, if you have access to a cluster. So that's probably the biggest barrier here is, you know, do you have a cluster or not? Um, if you do, then yeah, you can get started on this uh, fairly easily, I think. Um, cool. Um, so just you know a bit about the background. We don't really have to go into details here, but you know, in Scikit-Learn, they have this. Uh, they use this library called Joblib. It's a way to do basically do for loops in parallel. Um, so in Grid Search CV, if you think about it, there's some CV splits. You know, we had five in this case. So there's a big loop over the CV splits, and then there's a second for loop over the uh, hyperparameter combinations. So what, however many many we had here. Um, 30 some hyperparameter combinations. Um, so you get this, um, this big for loop of uh, models to fit. Uh, so you're looping over those. And internally, uh, scikit-learn uses joblib. And joblib can run stuff in parallel using either threads or processes on a single machine. So like I was saying, you know, if you're here where you're inside this box, and you know, maybe it's OK for you to sit for 10 minutes or something, you know, that's definitely you know, could be just fine. And so you're fine waiting around. Um, for for scikit learn to do the stuff in parallel on your single machine, you know that's fine. Um, but if you have a bigger problem, maybe instead of like twenty hyperparameters, you're searching over hundreds, um, and you want to distribute that on a cluster. Um, that's when you can use this Dask parallel backend. Um, and then so internally, Joblib talk, or scikit learn talks to Joblib, Joblib talks to Dask, and Dask is what handles scheduling all those tasks on all the workers on the cluster. So again, it's a small change uh, to get, you know, to unlock this uh, multi-machine parallelism, um, which works well for, um, you know, anything that does, has many small components, like a hyperparameter search, um, the trees in a random forest, fitting all those individual trees in a random forest. Um, libraries like Teapot use Joblib internally, and they generate all sorts of, uh, you know, independent tasks that can be fit in parallel. Um, yeah, so that's the basic idea behind that. Hey Tom, um, I want a question. Yeah, go ahead. So, so Matthew Alhonte asks, uh, would you say it's generally better to try to use your cluster to compress your data set down so you don't need distributed machine learning? So here you use a cluster for machine learning. Was that to, to do work on a big data set 
where 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 does where does parallel computing where does it fit in the machine learning cycle? Yeah, so I think yeah, so in this case it was a small data set. Um, so there's you know compressing wouldn't have done much here. Um, later on we'll see an example where we do have a large data set, um, and I think if you you know if you can compress it. Um, to something that fits in memory on a single machine, you should definitely do that because then you all avoid all the headaches that can come with uh, distributed computing. Um, hey everyone, hey Tom. Here you go. Hey, hey Matt. Welcome back. Good. I, I just Welcome. wanted, yeah, I'm I'm here, and I just wanted to apologize for everyone for the 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 tech nightmare, but we're here. We're ready ready to go. Um, I just want to let everyone know if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, that would be awesome. Let us know who you are, uh, where you're uh, watching from, and and what you do, and why you're interested. Um, I wonder if Tom, you could just give me twenty. Let me know in twenty seconds what we've what we've gone through um, so far, and then we can jump yeah. right, right back in. Yeah. So we've just gone through the um, you know the examples, the different types of scaling pains that people might run into, and we cool. saw an example of a CPU bound workload that uh, would have taken you know ten fifteen minutes to do on a single machine, uh, and we we ran it on the cluster in thirty seconds or something. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, so that's all. And I'll missed. just add. I love that two by two because you discuss it uh, wonderfully in, in, in the framework of, for machine learning, but it helps us reason about distributed compute in general, right? Um, it does, in terms of thinking about whether you're CPU bound or, or RAM bound. And it's a really nice framework for thinking about all types of distributed compute problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a good framing, especially for machine learning, I think. Uh, just since the strategies you have to employ differ so wildly yeah. depending on which axes yeah. you're scaling on. And I think I think there's also a misconception. When I tell people about distributed compute, they're like, oh, I don't work with data sets that are large enough. And I say, wait a second, that isn't the only reason to use distributed compute, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So reminding people that the CPU bound is, is the struggle is real. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, enough out of me. Cool. So yeah, I wanted to, you know, so that was a toy example uh, with a small data set. I wanted to try it out on a larger data set. So I'm going to kick off this computation. So we're going to be reading in, uh, again, the famous taxi data set, which uh, has been on at least one um, previous Science Thursday, um, the uh, uh, privacy focused one, I think it came up. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, and Matt may and have then, dealt with it in with the in the inaugural one as well. I can't remember. Okay. It's just yeah. the it's just the most like interpretable moderately large data set. It's yeah. super convenient. Thank goodness we know the cab drivers. Um, so anyway, we're just reading in some data, um, and then for the you know we're we're still in this vertical you know the the small data set side side of things. So I'm sampling off uh, like 0.1 percent I think of it. Um, and then computing it to bring it back uh, locally to my laptop. So this is um, some you know, 70, 80,000 rows here. Um, fits you know, fine in memory on my laptop. And we're gonna look um, through a few things. So this is like, I don't know, most of the components here are like dealing with um, things like data types, stuff you're dealing with whether you're using a small fits in memory data set or larger than memory data set. So I kind of wanted to show um, show that here. Um, in this case, we've got some uh, you know, categorical like uh, columns, um, vendor ID. I'm, I'm not sure if it's like the cab driver, uh, the company or what. Uh, I, don't, I don't have to know. There's like the, how did you, okay. There's like the, how did you pay credit card, cash, some other things. Uh, and we have information on like the the time, the you know, actual time that you're picked up and dropped off, number of passengers uh, as an integer. I don't know what this is, store and forward flag. So we got this mix of um, mix of data types, and so now we have to do some feature engineering to get them to a float floating point array, which Scikit Learn can understand um, the, the actual like machine learning model. Um, so we're gonna like we have this mess of code here, so. For like the date times, we're gonna just take off the, we have like a, it's called the sdf.tpep pickup time, um, drop off date time. And then we'll grab the day of week, uh, it's under .dt .day of week, uh, And we'll get the, yeah, so it's like an integer from zero to six. Um, and then we have things like the hour. So we'll just grab both of those. Um, uh, for, the, for the location, there's these different, IDs. Uh, I don't actually know what they um, correspond <laughs> to, but it's like, yeah, some position, some, some it's, it's uh, like section. neighborhoods. I think. Yeah, yeah. 
Fairly fine grain. Yeah, as, as, a, as a meta comment, it's always fun watching these videos because at every stage in any of these things, you're like, hey, I really want to talk about this really sophisticated, really complicated topic. Yeah. But before I can do that, here's this like mess of code we have to write yeah. to like clean up our data. And that's kind of where you are right now. Yep. And that's, yep. that's the beauty of Python, right? You can play yeah. with pandas, you can pass it off to scikit-learn, you can pass it off to PyTorch, whatever. Yeah. But you need that yeah. sort of like Python pandas junk in there to uh -huh. clean it up. Yeah, yep, yep, definitely. Um, so we get um, the locations. We'll, we'll throw these in a transformer later. Uh, and then for like the categorical ones, like the payment type, we'll use scikit-learn's one-hot encoder to dummy encode them. Um, we'll go into the details there, but it turns the column of uh, numeric or strings, I think it was in this case, to uh, multiple columns of numeric. Um, so yeah, like a, a bunch of stuff here that's kind of annoying uh, to write out, but it's it's not too bad. And then, you know, we have a pipeline here, um, which, you know, CycleLearn has this fancy new uh, oh, wrapper yeah. for their pipelines. And so you can kind of see it all come together here. Like we have the one hot encoded columns here. The I think this oh. is our... Uh, date times uh, columns here, um, and then our, our uh, position columns here. And you, you put it all together into a pipeline, standard scalar in the middle, and then a uh, gradient boosting classifier. So it's, yeah, you can That's kind of so see cool. how that ties. Is that from a yeah. recent release? Um, I think uh, 0.23. So okay. um, late last year, maybe? Yeah, it's yeah, like, awesome. and it's off by default. Um, I don't know what the default is, but yeah, you should definitely uh, use it. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I'm simultaneously blown away by that. I also realize like I'm blown away by something that like is like 90s level graphics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. <laughs> quite fun. So anyway, uh, we can go ahead and fit this. Um, I should have done it. I think it takes like 20 seconds. Um, we can continue to marvel at this. That's how it's interactive too. Um, you can expand to show the parameters that you specified versus, uh, well, yeah, I didn't specify any parameters there. But anyway, this was some big pipeline. It's doing some stuff with uh, pandas and NumPy and sticking them all together. I don't know if you saw, I, I glanced over it, but we're using scikit-learn compose, which is new in like 0.22 or something from a year or so ago, uh, to stick together these heterogeneous uh, D-type transformations into one. Um, and anyway, it finishes in 30 seconds or so. Um, I have actually those, a new yeah. question, um, and this may have been covered before I, before I joined. Um, you're writing all this scikit-learn code, but it's it's using Dask in the back end. Uh, not yet. This is actually um, just scikit-learn and pandas. So Dask okay. is not involved at all right now. All right. Um, but say you want to do some grid search over this. Um, we're actually going to use uh, Dask ML has a model selection um, grid search CV as well. I'll show mm -hmm. why we're going to use that in a second, but we want to do some grid search over that. And again, same sort of thing. We don't want to wait around for it to finish off. You know, this took 30 yeah. seconds. If we have some large number of uh, parameters we want to search over, then it would take a while. Um, I want to show you why we're using Dask ML's model selection. So if you look at the counts here, this is the number of each of these tasks. Uh, and you can see the standard scalar, it's really small, sorry, but the standard scalar, there's only three of them. Whereas for something like the gradient boosting, there's 36 of them. Um, and so that's because uh, Dask ML's grid search and randomized search CV um, actually kind of knows that in this big grid search, we're only searching over this last stage here. So everything up to it, so all this one hot encoding, all this standard scalar, um, that's, that's shared amongst all the hyperparameters we're searching for. So we only need to do it once per CV split. Um, it ends up like they took like 30 uh, like milliseconds. So it doesn't matter in this case, but if you have something like NLP type workload where you're doing a bunch of pre-processing um, upfront that's expensive, uh, then you might want to uh, consider using the Dask ML version, which um, does kind of like avoid recomputing those unnecessarily. Um, anyway. Right. Um, and you may have done this already, but can you just give us a quick talk through all the task stream and, and what's happening there? Yeah, behind I did do time, that. You go behind the time. Come on, you go. Oh. You got to stay up. <laughs> yeah, so we're good there. I don't think I actually showed like the, the tasks uh, zooming in here. This one's not too interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll pull that up later. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, that's uh, the base idea. There's um, very similar to what we were doing before, which is like the simple random data set with the job load backend. Uh, it's extremely similar to that, except now we're using a more realistic example, which unfortunately means we have all this uh, annoying pre-processing code, but um, 
you know, it, it, we're, it, it ends up working out just fine. Um, I mean, what, we can still use our cluster. What I really like about your example though, is like, I actually, I think that cell, cell 27, is when you decided to use Dask. Like right. we like yeah. almost kind of skipped over the part we decided to use Dask. Mm -hmm. Using pandas, scikit-learn, pandas, scikit-learn, wait, let's like scale up a little bit. Yeah. You did like a couple of things and now we're, now we're off and running. And yep. the fact that you can just put a scikit-learn pipeline directly into a Dask ML hyperparameter optimization like is a result of a lot of work. I think I think Jim Christ did most of that work early on. Um, yes. Yep. He did. Yeah, like uh, it's actually it's very cool. impressive how little how little happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite neat. And then it's also oh well, yeah. Uh, it's not just that you can put a second learn pipeline into this thing. It's that you can put um, Dask ML native or Dask native estimators inside a second learn pipeline. So it kind of goes both directions. And you can feed that into this uh, Dask ML grid search. So it's 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 nice to have these um, kind of shared foundations that we can all build off of, I guess. You haven't seen that yet, though, right? I assume that's kind no, of no. We have not yet, which okay. we can go to, um, depending on on what people want to see. I actually don't know. Um, I think we started about ten minutes late. So what time are we shooting to be done by? Ten, 10, past? 10 minutes late. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm having a good yeah. I mean, out of all respect to the viewers who are here uh, live, it is super fun. It's great having you all. The vast majority of people watching this will be watching it uh, asynchronously. Um, so we can also uh, help them a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, couple um, of questions are there any from the questions from the chat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Roberto asks, are you going to share the notebook? Uh, yes. Yeah, great. Uh, and then uh, Elite and I'm just linked Programmer. In the chat as well. And Elite Programmer asks, uh, how do you get these graphs? Um, which graphs, I wonder? I'm guessing, I'm guessing Elite Programmer means the, the dashboard. Mm. Yes, probably the dashboard. So uh, I have a um, client's object. I skipped over that very briefly. I'll go back up to the top. But I have a started this cluster, uh, coil cluster. Uh, but this would work locally uh, or with coil. any other thing. Yes, as well. yeah. I know. Uh, so you sign up for coil, whatever, uh, if you want that cluster. But anyway, um, then I, I have this client thing, and that has a, a link to a dashboard that, that I can view. And so this is the DAS dashboard. Um, it's a bokeh web application, and so you know anywhere you're running a cluster, whether you're um, you know deploying Dask uh, on your own uh, on like some Kubernetes or HPC system, whether you're running it locally, you've got access to this uh, cluster. It's just just a cool, very cool bokeh application. And and someone in the chat when I asked um what what brought you to this um to this live stream, they said the Dask dashboards, and they said that they like to call it Dask TV. So I don't know if you've heard that before. I don't think I have. I've heard the yeah. Dask board, which is uh, like <laughs> um, what's the name of the uh, the hidden plot for the uh, pew pew pew? Is that the cluster map? In individual dash cluster dash map. Yeah. You should be running dash. the Jupyter Lab extension, Tom. Uh, I I forgot to install it. Um, individual. Oh well. Uh, I can find it. But. Yeah. Anyway, it's a fun, uh, fun, very fun plot if you haven't seen it yet. Um, okay, where were we? Any other questions before we move on? Um, I've got um, a great question that Matt might like to field. What's the difference between coiled, Dask Plus provider, and Saturn Cloud? Oh, that's a, like that's a whole other <laughs> webinar. Uh, I'll try to put on my like unbiased hat. There are all ways in which you can deploy a Dask. Uh, sort of. So Dask is a distributed system. It's like a bunch of processes that are running on machines. And you need to find some way to run all those processes. And things like Kubernetes can help with you with that. Uh, but it ends up being sort of awkward to, uh, to manage a bunch of stuff. There's things like security, authentication permissions, which a bunch of things will try to solve for you. Uh, Coiled and Saturn are both companies that try to solve that for you. Uh, Saturn would be a competitor of Coiled, only one could say. Uh, and Dask Cloud Provider is what you're talk probably talking about. It's probably the easiest way that's totally open source if you're an individual and want to run AWS uh, to get started. I'll just add on, on, on top of that, Tom's going to uh, hopefully get around to playing around with, with Coiled and, and the product we're working on. But we're, we're opening our beta currently. So if you if you like um, to break things at scale and want to help us iterate on a, on, on a product and get free uh, compute, compute hours at, at the same time, um, we'd love for you to check out uh, our product at coiled.io and sign up for our, our beta there and, and chat with us. Um, so this is like 
when you when you listen to podcasts and like in the middle there's an intermission <laughs> where they send you ads, this is like that intermission. Here. We've yeah. never done this before. I'm not sure how I feel about it. No, I'm the human version of, of that. <laughs> sponsored sponsored by Hugo. Yeah. Um, all right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Now back to a regular a regular scheduled program. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so um, we're kind of going to stop thinking about the large model side of the things and and focus instead on uh, what to do when your data set grows large in the memory. Um, we have a couple of ways we can take this depending on time. Like I can try. Um, try and do something that's probably silly, but let's like think about this huge thing that we just did. Um, it's a bad idea. I didn't prep it, but like since we were talking about, it's nice that these things work well together. We can kind of think about what it looks like to try and um, try and transform this workflow, like this huge mess of code. Earlier, we were working on these the small data frame locally. What if we what if we tried to do that on DF instead? Um, Let's, let's budget like five minutes to this because <laughs> uh, it's a bad idea. But yeah, we're, we're going to try it out, I think. Um, so I had this bit of pre-processing here where I, uh, first of all, I dropped some missing values. Want to remember that. And then I had this as type. Um, we're actually just going to keep those D types. OK, cool. So now we're going to be working with DAS data structures. So our data set is bigger than memory. We can't actually fit it onto a single machine. And we want to try and do this similar type of workflow. Um, so before we had our you know, DF, uh, let's call it DF2, uh, we had the dropping missing values. And then we had um, DF2. Uh, let's just do this all in one method chain. And then we want to do an as type. Um, as type to the new D types. So these are these are pandas data types, but DAS uh, uses the same, DAS data frame uses pandas data type. So it's just fine to be able to do that. Um, and then uh, we will, uh, yeah, we'll just do that. That's all, all we have to do right now. Okay. And then we'll do our drop. Uh, so X is gonna be df.drop. Y is going to be uh, DF of tip amount greater than zero. Cool. So like this is now a, a DAS data frame, a DAS series. Um, again, addressing this much larger than memory data set, except now we're working um, with DAS data structures. Um, so when you're like translating pandas code to DAS data frame code, like there are a few things. Like so up until yesterday, DAS data frame didn't have a, an items method. <laughs> Uh, I opened this issue because I was preparing this notebook and it didn't work. It was like, oh, okay. We just, no one had asked for it yet. And so, you know, it's implemented now. Somebody, uh, Thomas Fawn, a scikit-learn um, oh, maintainer oh. actually implemented it. Go ahead. Well, I was just saying, oh, Thomas, great. Yes, him. yes, very helpful. Um, so, you know, maybe we just write it like this. So for K and DF and X dot columns, V is, mm. you know, uh, X and K, that's fine. All this stuff with like DT, day and week, hour, all that's gonna be fine. And then you got to think about like things where you're calling top level pandas methods. So rather than um, rather than pddoc concat, uh, I think I have dash dot data frame imported. We use dddoc concat, um, and we actually have to use. Uh, there's this uh, one more thing. We want this ignore an unknown divisions flag uh, equal true. Um, in this case, so like different data models, we know that these are going to have the same division, so we're fine here. Um, Just to be clear, what we're yeah. seeing here is we're seeing you translate all of your pandas code to dot data frame. Yes. Uh, yep. You're trying to get it done under five minutes. And so far, yes. everything has been the same, except for that one keyword argument and items, which we've just yep. added. Yep. Also, uh, quick tip, uh, import dot data frame as DD. Ah, uh, that'll help. Um, yeah, so then the uh, transform location, this is fine. Uh, you know, we can x dot pickup location ID. You know, this is just a, um, I guess it's DF. Uh, I mean, we can do this. Um, it's just some, yeah, equality operation, just fine. Uh, we don't care about that. Um, and then things, so then where stuff kind of uh, gets a bit more complicated is once you have like these scikit-learn methods. Mm -hmm. So scikit-learn, um, uh, you know, it, it works with um, uh, NumPy arrays, pandas data frames, essentially. And so for some of these pre-processing methods, we have had to um, kind of re-implement those in DASCML. 
Um, so I think I've, later on I'll link to all these, but you know we have some dasml.preprocessing.1hotencoder. Um, it's very similar. It just knows how to deal with um, it knows how to deal with DAS data structures. Um, something like a um, uh, this should be DF, not SDF. Uh, all of these should be uh, DF2, I think is what we're calling it. Now this is uh, getting a little uh, getting a little risky here, but we'll make it work. This probably won't work actually, so that's okay. But you can get a sense of what we're actually doing mm -hmm. here. Um, yeah, it's really fascinating know. what you have to change and what you don't have to change. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, so this does not change. Like I mentioned before, you know, we can stick these scikit-learn uh, or these DASK-aware estimators inside a scikit-learn pipeline. Um, I'll change this to DASKML um, dot preprocessing um, dot one hot encoder. Yep, that should work. Um, I'm actually going to get rid of these um, because, yeah, I think this will break. So anyway, um, we'll see why in a second. Um, and then that's fine. Uh, and then this, uh, we, we do have a dasml uh, compose, which I'll need to import. So uh, imports. Okay, I think we're about at our budget here. So let's just like see if this works. Um, I don't know why it's computing anything. I must have made a horrible mistake. Um, well, you didn't have the data loaded. Maybe there was like in the categorize call and needed to- Yeah, could be, could be. I mean, so what I love about this is that you're not just, um, like changing all the scikit-learn to DaskMLs. In lots of cases, you're actually just leaving them as they are. Like some of them actually mm -hmm. just work, mm -hmm. uh, which is like a whole nother level of compatibility. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then the, like, so this stuff, um, the, the part that I couldn't get working in time for today is the, um, uh, something that would work with this gradient boosting classifier. Like, so this is kind of where we get back to what's easy to do uh, in Dask and Dask ML is like all this pre-processing stuff is, you know, doable um, with a bit of effort. You know, we've implemented things like the uh, column transformer in Dask ML. Uh, we've implemented things like the one hot encoder. Um, so that kind of stuff is doable. We haven't implemented a, you know, distributed uh, gradient boosted trees yet. Uh, sorry. Uh, and so, so that's where you kind of have to get into uh, different stuff like um, using things like incremental. Um, which, uh, you know, like fitting, uh, feeding batches of data to, um, to the second learn estimator. Um, yeah, I had a question about that, Tom. I, like it's, I think I can reason about how we could do a distributed or batch linear regression or k-nearest neighbors and that type of stuff. Like cognitively, I can figure, figure that out. But are, are there models where it's actually entirely unintuitive to figure out how to do it with larger than memory data? Um, so for, for um, are there models, the easy way to do that, to figure that out is go to the scikit-learn documentation. Um, and there's a page, I forget, it's like computational strategies for scaling to larger data or something. And it lists everything that implements the partial fit API. Um, so if you see anything that implements partial fit, you know that that can deal with larger than memory data sets by mm -hmm. feeding it batches of data at a time. Um, as far as like, you know, what's so like a uh, gradient boosting classifier is not one of those models um nope. i don't know i don't know the details of how this is implemented um about why it can't uh or doesn't have that uh method but things like yeah so there's just like different ones um and something like a linear regression can't be done because you know if you think about the uh normal equations or whatever uh if you're if you know your stats uh you know those you, you can't get those uh, in batches, but for something like an SGD, a stochastic gradient descent, that can be mm. done in batches. So that's like the best I can do for an intuitive explanation. But as far mm. as that, like an app applying this type thing is look at the cycle learn docs and see what implements partial fit. Um, and I've just linked to those docs in, in the chat. The other thing, which I, I don't know whether we've touched upon yet is that a lot of the time, maybe you want to fit on something in memory, but you want to do prediction on larger than memory data, right? Yeah, yeah. So that was, um, I'm debating whether or not I should run this or not. Um, I think this will not blow anything up. Uh, yeah, so it, not fitted error. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got a fit transform. Uh, this could be a bad idea. And it doesn't work. I like you say this could uh, be a bad idea and you keep yeah. going yeah. through. That's great. <laughs> um, anyway, a couple questions. Uh, 
couple questions from the chat, if you have a, bit, if you have a minute. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. a drawer was actually very uh, perceptive and said, hey, you had to load the data twice, it looks like. I think he looked, was looking at the task stream plot and noticed yeah. that it loaded and loaded again. Yeah. Uh, and then presumably it'll load it again during fitting. Is that yes. necessary? Uh, no, probably not. Um, I, think, um, I think it was being loaded because something was calling Len um, on the, the data. So like mm -hmm. some, uh, I'm not exactly sure. I probably missed translating one of these from scikit-learn to Dask. I don't know mm -hmm. exactly which one. Uh, and that probably called like Len on the data set. And for Dask data frame, it doesn't know how big each the data set is. So it has to load it all into data. Um, so if you wanted to avoid that, and if you have the large enough cluster, you would uh, you know, persist your data. So you'd say, uh, you know, x equal to x dot persist. Um, this will actually load the data into distributed memory. Um, if you look at like all of these, uh, you know, this is doing several things like get item, read CSV, land chunk. Um, all the time is spent, you know, either waiting for bytes from the network or parsing those bytes with pandas read CSV. That's like, uh, you know, combines for like 80, 90% of the time. And then something here, Dask is doing some stuff here, um, which will be eventually doing some scikit learn thing probably. So huh. um, maybe the, maybe yeah. that people haven't seen that plot before or are familiar with flame graph plot. Mm, sure. Can you break that down yeah. very briefly? And if you can bump yeah. up your screen size, maybe you can make it full screen just for a second. That would probably yeah. be welcome, I think. Yeah, so I clicked on the task. Uh, let's see if I can reload this. So I, I clicked on the task um, for the read item, read CSV. And this is, um, Showing where your CPU or where the worker, the DAS worker's CPU time, CPU's time was spent. Um, and this is like the call stack going vertically. So read block from file is some uh, function. If you look there, the file names and DAS bytes core. Um, and that's doing some stuff. And eventually we'll see like, uh, you know, S3 FS probably. And eventually down to like socket for, you know, reading bytes off the socket. Um, and then if you look at the very bottom of this uh, tooltip, you'll see it's the percent time where there was 45%. And if we go sideways, like the rest of the time, 45% was, uh, was spent on the waiting for bytes from the network. 43% um, was spent in pandas uh, in read CSV, which is like you know, parsing those bytes into a data frame. And then the rest was spent somewhere. Uh, I'm not actually sure what's going on here, but that's, a, that's the basic idea. Drop so, it. So if I mean looking looking at this, like that computation took some time. If I wanted to make my computation faster, yeah. I see that I'm spending 90% of my time just reading my data into memory. Yeah. And I could solve about half of that by switching from CSV to something like Parquet. Mm -hmm. But even then I'm still spending half my time just downloading it. Yeah. Uh, and so that this gives me sort of a sense for where I should be spending my time optimizing and how much I can get out yeah. of out of these optimizations. Yeah. Yep. So it's a very handy debugging tool. Um, okay. But in the interest of um, time, yeah. maybe we'll mm -hmm. move on and then um, maybe wrap this section up and jump into uh, scalable ML using coil in five minutes or so, if that works. Sure. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I would get fired. Uh, I'd fire myself if I didn't mention that you should definitely uh, plot learning curves before trying to do Absolutely. scalable distributed machine learning. So. Uh, and I, I don't want you to fire yourself. Good, good. Um, But yeah, this is an important point and something that we made very clear we'd cover is when and when not to do, like avoid doing distributed compute if you can, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've well, redefined X, so classic mistake. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get to my uh, X here. Just to narrate what I think is running, Tom is running into, he was previously running with pandas and this whole experiment of like switching from pandas to Dask in five minutes, which you know was a noble effort, but uh, did not did not succeed. Uh, but now all of his data sets are I think named the same, uh, but are now Dask things rather than NumPy or pandas things. Yeah, uh, and so now he's going back and uh, and reloading things as as pandas. Yep. So I'm uh, just going to comment on this. I appreciate this, I... the gumption. Uh, yeah. um, it was a bad idea. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> I redefined all my variables to the same names. Uh, I think so the world is built by, by people with bad ideas. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Ideally, like, yeah, so that could be improved, I guess, if uh, uh, those estimators handled. Mm, oh, yeah, I messed it up in two ways, I think. So, anyway, so now we're going to um, 
plot a learning curve. So the basic idea behind a learning curve, we're using scikit-learn's learning curve here, and we're feeding it some you know, small data sets. So xx, yy, these are 50,000 rows, regular NumPy stuff, NumPy and pandas. And we're plotting a learning curve. If you notice, we're actually using DAS to fit the learning curve in parallel. So we're using distributed cluster to figure out, should we do distributed machine learning? Um, at least in this case, the answer is uh, no, because if you look at uh, this is how the model perform, performs, so the training score and the uh, cross-validation score, if you look at how it performs over time, um, over, sorry, over the, as you increase the number of examples, uh, really past like 15,000, uh, 20,000, there's basically no difference between the, uh, how the model's performing. So as the number of examples grows, this model is not getting any better. Um, and that's mainly because it's such a simple model. So we're doing a linear regression or logistic regression here. So there's like no reason to feed it, you know, however many hundreds of thousands or millions of rows are in this full data set, um, you're much better off like sampling it or doing some other strategy to um, just do the, the small data set on, you know, regular scikit-learn NumPy stuff. There's, there's no need for Dask distributed stuff in this case. Um, yeah. Can I explain? Well, that's that? great. And, and I suppose that's about um, figuring out distributing number of rows. Um, there's also mm -hmm. a, a question about columns, right? Or features. Can be, yeah. Um, which, um, yeah, so as you increase the number of features, you're going to get a more complex model, which can typically benefit or support more um, rows. So there's this, this plot is definitely you know, given some estimator, uh, how does it perform with uh, an increasing number of examples? And so, yeah, as we make the estimator more complex, we add more, um, more features to the uh, estimator or as we move to inherently more complex estimators like a random forest or a gradient boosting tree, then you might, might see a different plot here. Yeah, I also meant that perhaps if you have columns that essentially, or a lot of features that don't have much predictive power, perhaps, <laughs> you don't want to in include them in your model and then you don't necessarily need to do distributed compute or you don't have out of memory then. Yep, yep, definitely. Cool. Where should we go next? Do, do we want to talk about blockwise stuff or do we want to uh, shift focus? I'd, I'd love to, I haven't seen someone do use DaskML or do distributed machine learning using Coiled yet. So that would be really fun. This is using coil. Yeah, that's all as far as I know. You go. <laughs> We've been on coil the whole time. You didn't even know it. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I missed that completely. I skipped over it because it was so simple. Uh, that, <laughs> that's start, a, start some look, Amazing that you're using our, our. It's so it's so simple. I didn't even notice. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that would be great. It'd be interesting to talk about hyperband as well if, if you're interested or what whatever your whatever you'd like to do. I didn't quite get hyperband, uh, the example done. Uh, and I've already failed one demo. So should we risk it and try and fail two? Um, this, is, this whole time is like a playtime for us. So you should not yeah. feel the need to be particularly well polished. All right. uh, I think yeah. that people come to these a lot of times because it is a little messy and because it is a little gritty. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can explain a little bit about what hyperband does. And as we are failing at something, we can talk about yeah. it. I think again, I think the folks who are coming to these are actually pretty, pretty okay with seeing behind behind the scenes. And that's actually where I that's think good. a lot of your value comes from, because you are behind the scenes in a yeah. lot of these projects. Yeah. Yeah. So Hugo asked like 10 minutes before we started, it's like, hey, can you show hyperband? It's like probably. <laughs> so uh, it, it's just gonna be on a dummy data set here. So we have some uh, you know, data set, some circles, and you wanna uh, distinguish the blue ones from the red ones. Um, mm -hmm. And this is uh, taken from, once I finish this notebook, I'll add in the links. But if you go to examples.das.org, there's a nice example showing this. Um, so this is a small data set. First thing we need to do is generate that data set on the cluster. Um, everything's going to be out of order here from what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, take this uh, circles data set, um, add some noise to it. Um, and then stack them together. So add some um, additional redundant features here, 20 features that are just random noise uh, to make the data set bigger, make the problem a bit harder. Uh, and then we're gonna use DAS delayed to um, build up a bigger data set. So this is um, 
Uh, not big enough yet, apparently. Uh, how many did I do? 10, let's do 100 of these. Um, so not very good. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. I mean, just to try to summarize a little bit. So, so hyperband, I think, is a method for hyperparameter optimization, like yes. Ritzer CV, but a little bit, a little bit slicker, a little bit more sophisticated. Yeah. Uh, so that, by by Scott Siebert, by the way, at Dask maintainer. Yes. Uh, um, you were trying to play with it, but before, before we do that, we didn't have a data set that is large. Right. We don't have like a like a Dask equivalent of the make circles function from Scikit-Learn. So right. you are on the fly making that function. I think by using we'll the lower level tools in Dask, like from like delayed objects to run the scikit-learn function many, many times in parallel and then stack all those together into a Dask array. Mm -hmm. um, trying to, I don't persist, our collections, uh, let's just do it. How do you use dask.persist? I didn't do anything on my cluster. We'll just do this. Uh, oh, is it because, uh, where is this? X, Y, cool. You need to, um, you need to concatenate Y. So ah, that's you've got X it. equals concatenate X's and Y equals concatenate Y's. Uh, this is, this is the is. value of uh, live coding is you have friends. Thank Ooh, you lots of black, it does not look good. Yep, I typo there. I think we're good. And then X and Y is gonna be dash dot versus. So now what we're doing is loading this into memory on the cluster. Uh, this should start doing some stuff, maybe. Um, maybe not. Blame Hugo if this doesn't work. Mike, yes, something? right now you are shipping the graph from your local machine off to the cloud. And then maybe your, your wireless internet is a little bit slow. Could be. Could be. Um, anyway. I'll accept full blame. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can. Um, we can get rid of this example since that's what. Uh, so there's a question says. in the chat. Yeah. Uh, so the question states, Dask ML is just a wrapper around scikit-learn, right? Uh, on Dask, how hard is it to write and deploy custom algorithms not covered by Dask ML? Yeah, so I think that's going to be fundamentally down to the, uh, the complexity of the algorithm. Uh, it's just going to be like, you know, <laughs> Something like a, a grid, uh, you know, random forest is relatively easy. Um, and we actually use scikit learns for that. Something like a gradient boosted tree is going to be much more complicated. Um, so Dask gives you the building blocks uh, and it gives you the, the data structures as well. Um, it's really interesting, actually, people have a moment to maybe write down the algorithms that they care about. Yeah. And maybe if we see some common trends in there, we can ask Tom about whether or not Dask ML supports these algorithms. Uh, or not. All right, let's do something like this. 400 gigabytes, maybe too much. 40 gigs, all right. So x, y equals dash dot persist, uh, x and y. All right, so we're gonna randomly generate this data on the cluster, if it's still around. And then uh, throw that into hyperband. So the way hyperband works uh, is it's a, uh, uh, it's again a um, hyperparameter optimization uh, uh, method algorithm uh, for you know picking the best hyper uh, hyperparameters for some job, and the basic idea is like it's kind of a simple intuitive idea. Hopefully, I specified everything correctly. Um, got this MLP multi-layer perceptron classifier, some bunch of hyperparameters that control how it fits. Um, Anyway, the idea behind hyperband is to um, take um, this big grid of possibilities and uh, fit all of them a bit, give them all some examples, um, and then start to gradually kill off the models that aren't performing well. Uh, so there's you know, just going to be some hyperparameter combinations in here that inherently work well for the problem. Uh, and the other ones work less well. And you want to prioritize giving you know, more examples, more training examples to ones that are working well, um, and then gradually kill off the ones that aren't working well. So the it makes crucial- me think of like yeah. multi-arm bandits or something yeah. like that, like exploration yeah. and exploitation, right? Yep, definitely. Very, very similar idea there. And I think, yeah, similar math in the background as well. Cool. Um, 
and yeah, so it, it does crucially rely on the fact that there's this uh, partial fit. So um, the estimator passed to this grid search uh, wherever it is defined. Um, this, uh, <laughs> that's funny, I forgot to define it. Um, it needs to implement, we're, we're using the wrong estimator here. So this is why you don't do stuff live. I'm gonna kill this uh, and define the search mm. here. Uh, right, so you're trying to use a gradient boosted estimator inside of hyperband, which won't work because gradient boosted estimator doesn't doesn't train incrementally. It trains all at once. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. So we would want this model here. And then the params here. Uh, that's why you don't reuse variable names. Uh, lesson learned again. And so now <laughs> this search is uh, hopefully what we want. I don't know why sometimes this uh, takes a while to render. It could also be my machine. It looks like your workers are also still busily computing yeah. on the gradient boosted trees. Um, while we're waiting for that, there's a question. Um, uh, so we are asking about algorithms people want to, want to implement on their own. So mm -hmm. I mentioned cat boost. Yeah, I'm not super or, familiar with cat boost. Maybe more broadly, I'll, I'll offer you a, a softer question. Uh, is there any, is there any um, support for gradient boosted trees? in Dask ML, or which green yeah. boosted trees libraries does Dask ML support? Yeah, um, so I don't think uh, there's the, uh, probably the best one is um, uh, Dask XGBoost. It's a little confusing since um, uh, both, um, I think I need this. Um, Dask XGBoost is probably the best one. There's a native implementation in, um, uh, in XGBoost itself, where you can pass Dask arrays, data frames to XGBoost. Um, that's probably the one I would check out, see if it works. There's also this older uh, Dask dash XGBoost package um, that might work as well. Um, There's also oh, a GBM with, support, yeah. is that right? Yes, Dask Lite GBM. I haven't tried it out personally. Yeah, what's fun about this is that like you actually haven't written these libraries. They're written by other, by other folks. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know what's going on. Uh, two failed demos. We were too risky, I guess. That's no, right. we're bold. We're bold. Uh, That's the answer. Very bold, and I take full responsibility for this. I think you've you've done an <laughs> incredible job. Um, no. Oh, you know what? I just figured out what's wrong. Um, well, we should we should probably uh, throw in the towel at some point. But anyway, well, the issue. Yeah. I don't know if that point has come yet, though, Tom. <laughs> Let's put him out of his misery. Yeah. What I usually do in your situation, Tom, when I give demos all the time and sometimes they break because the world is a complicated place. What I do in this situation is I usually go to examples.dask.org yeah. and I bring up one of the examples there, which we know work really well. That's a um, great idea. So, so Tom is doing all this stuff live, which is honestly how we operate usually as data scientists in Python. We break things for a long time before they work. And then they work smoothly. And then we report them out to the world. Um, so we've already done that a bunch of times at examples.dask.org. And there are examples about using Dask and XGBoost. There are examples about using uh, Hyperband. Uh, there are examples about using lots of different things that you can run yourself with the same kind of environment that Tom has set up here, uh, just a little bit smaller. It looks uh, like now that so we've hunted, it looks like things are actually working on your do you want to guess? Do you want to guess what the issue was? What was the issue? I, I renamed X again. Oh, no. <laughs> This is, uh, yeah, this is why you always need to keep your uh, notebooks nice and clean. Oh, uh, actually, so Tom, while we're looking at this, can you interpret what's happening on the dashboard? Things are breaking. Yeah, it doesn't look great. So I think part of the issue is I have uh, randomly generated twice as much data as I expected. So I have, I have my old X. Um, it's actually a bit complicated. So typically when you delete a variable, it goes away. Uh, mine was cached by Jupyter when you're like right here. Uh, Jupyter or IPython holds on to a reference to this thing. So if I really wanted to delete it, I would need something like uh, percent X del X yeah, would have gotten rid of it. Tom, for just, yep. just uh, briefly for a second though, like you noticed very quickly you're running out of RAM. How did you yes. notice that? You notice that things were right. breaking. Can you walk through that for a second? Yep, so that's this one here is uh, the histogram of memory usage per worker. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is showing that in orange, I think each of these workers has like 16 gigs of RAM available. And so mm -hmm. we're getting to a uh, limit that's uncomfortable. Uh, so typically the solution here is to use a smaller chunk size. 
um, or to not accidentally load your data set twice. Uh, think more carefully about that. Um, the second place this is showing up is we're actually swapping to disk here um, on our workers. Uh, and that's the orange bars in the middle. Yeah, so anytime you see this, it's like uh, very, very concerning. Um, so yeah, you'd want to uh, be, be careful for that. Um, yeah. So if you, if you needed to get more memory, how could you do that? Um, a couple of ways you could ask. So right now my kernel is blocking. So I'd have to interrupt this, unfortunately. Um, but if you just need it on the fly, you can do cluster.scale and tell it, you know, I, I need you know, 40 workers instead of 10. Or uh, you could potentially uh, change your cluster to adaptive mode um, or start it up in adaptive. I, I don't know if you can switch uh, halfway through. Um, but this would scale your clusters, uh, the number of workers in your cluster uh, based on the demand. Um, so it'll see, hey, you're running out of memory, you need more workers, and then give you more workers. So if we had previously run adaptive, when DAS yep. noticed, hey, I'm running out of RAM, we actually would have seen the worker count increase. Yep, 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 yep. exactly. So um, anyway, that's the uh, basic idea behind uh, hyperband is, you know, it's, it's very similar, except it can work on, can in theory, work on these larger than memory data sets. Uh, as long as the estimate estimator implements the uh, partial fit API, it can send it, um, send it smaller ones. So if you go to examples.das.org, um, that's the place to check out. And then uh, this hyperparameter optimization with DAS goes through all of that in detail and it'll show you, you know, eventually how you uh, get your, your pretty normal estimator with all your things like the uh, number of partial fit calls is hyperband specific, but things like how long it took to fit, test for, uh, for that hyperparameter combination. That's great. So taking this back to the great mental model um, uh, you showed us at the start of CPU and memory bound compute, um, hyperband among other things helps us with the, the top right quadrant, right? Yeah, yeah. So both the right, um, all right, yeah. So every, everything in the top half here. Uh, yeah. So CPU bound for sure, since the idea is to kill off you know poorly performing models. And then it's a big grid search type thing, random search, and then works on larger than memory data sets as long as the estimator implements partial fit. Great. So we've got a couple of questions before wrapping up. Um, first, is there any chance we could put the requirements file in the repo with the notebook? Um, I think um, I can. I'll, it's a conda environment, or it's, I can just say the default coiled environment, <clears throat> whatever is in there. Um, that reminds me, because I joined late, I, 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 I presume you introduced yourself, um, but you maintain a bunch of packages and you work at Anaconda and we're really grateful for Anaconda for um, all the work they do and all the work you do there as well. Yeah, well, yes, to be clear, I, I do nothing on the packaging side. So I'm also grateful for all the work they do. But like Dask came out of Anaconda. Right. And we can, yes. we can thank Anaconda for, for that origin story yeah. uh, as well as many other amazing packages. We saw Bokeh here today with the dashboard. We mm -hmm. saw you saw everything with Conda. Uh, there's probably half a dozen other packages that we also touched here that uh, Conda helps maintain, that Anaconda helps maintain. Mm -hmm. um, and Draw had one other question. Is there a way to tell the DAS cluster to just delete all persisted tasks? Um, uh, the hammer is to restart the cluster. Um, a little more fine-grained is to uh, uh, cancel the futures. Um, like, it's like the ideal way is uh, to just delete all your references to the data. Um, and then that's like the normal Python rules. I, I got tripped up by the, the caching here. And sorry, Tom, when you say restart the cluster, do you mean like power off a bunch of machines? Or, yeah, there we go. I mean, client.restart and that will uh, get rid of everything uh, here. So now you'll see your workers will come back or they're fine, but their memory usage has gone down to zero. Um, and I, I thought I'd, uh, Thomas J. Fan um, has a comment saying all the debugging tips are great. And that's feedback we've got time and time again with these sessions is, you know, the overarching themes are great, but seeing people kind of dive and jump in, in the weeds with us to, to figure out the nitty gritty of how people write Dask and Dask ML code and scikit-learn code um, is, is super instructive. So I think the, the live coding aspect, uh, once again, is... is Super Thomas cool. is also the uh, the creator of the new items method that we were talking about earlier. So he's uh, already been oh, wow. uh, cameoed here. Yeah, yeah you awesome. need, need more RAM, Tom. This is uh, too big of a computation for you. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so. 
think so. But you guys ask for 100 machines, it'll take about a minute. But we might want to do, might want to cut, cut things down. Yeah, I think so. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone for joining. Um, and uh, clearly coiled this time worked um, so seamlessly, I didn't even realize it, it was being used. So once again, if you want to sign up for our, our, our beta and, and, and break our product and help us make it, make it better and better, please go to coiled.io. Um, and also, it's always great chatting, chatting with Matt. Um, and I'd just like to thank Tom for, for coming and, and, and doing su such a great job and being so interesting as, as always with, with all of this stuff. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. I look forward me. to doing it again sometime. Of course. Yep. I'll get I'll get this notebook cleaned up and then uh, working and then pushed up to GitHub uh, and then we can send it out. It'll be at uh, Tom Oxberger uh, slash uh, Science Thursday, I think. Awesome. And I'll send I'll send that around as well. And I've I've shared it in in, in the chat. And if you enjoyed the video, everyone, when it um, it'll be on our on our YouTube channel very soon. Um, it'd be great if you could could share it with with your networks and people you think might be interested. Great. Um, so without further ado, I think Matt, you have the the button to sign us out. That's right. Yeah. Um, All right. Thanks, okay. everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Tom. Thanks.